So this is the activity for chapter 23, the respiratory system. Part 1, lung cancer. Daniel McDonald, a 68-year-old male with a 40-pack-a-year smoking history, suffered from chronic bronchitis for which he had been on antibiotics for several months. Two weeks ago, he began coughing up a bloody sputum called hemoptysis, and in the past week, he's become increasingly short of breath. A routine chest x-ray revealed two silver dollar-sized opacities on the superior portion of the right main bronchus. Bronchoscopic examination revealed a tumor that was nearly occluding the right main bronchus. A bronchial biopsy revealed the diagnosis, bronchogenic carcinoma. Number one, a carcinoma is a cancer of an epithelial lining. Describe the anatomy of the respiratory mucosa lining the respiratory tract. 90% of all cancers arise from epithelial tissue. Why do you suppose this is? So the respiratory mucosa consists of, first, an epithelial layer, which is primarily pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. It also consists of a connective tissue layer, which is made up of areolar tissue, and in the mucous membranes, this areolar tissue is called the lamina propria. So here is an image of a slide, so you can see the pseudostratified columnar epithelium. It has cilia on the free surface of the cells facing the lumen, and then underneath the basement membrane that divides the epithelium from the connective tissue, we have the areolar connective tissue called the lamina propria. And embedded within the epithelium are mucus cells called goblet cells, and these produce mucus. So in the upper respiratory system, the lamina propria also contains mucus glands. So this is in addition to the mucus producing goblet cells in the epithelium. Occasionally in the lamina propria, you can also find mucus glands that have ducts that run up to the surface of the epithelium where they also secrete mucus. In the lower respiratory system, the lamina propria contains smooth muscle cells, which allows for adjustments in the diameter of the bronchioles, such as bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation. So to answer the second question about why you are more likely to find cancers in epithelial tissue, well, epithelial tissue is the first type of tissue that would come into contact with a carcinogen. Remember from a and 1 that epithelial tissue makes up all of our linings. So it's lining the outside of the body as well as all the cavities and the organs inside the body. So any encounter that we have with a carcinogen is first going to come into contact with an epithelial tissue. Secondly, epithelial tissue also contains rapidly dividing cells. So again, in AMP1, we talked about how epithelium had the uh, property of regeneration. So because it is rapidly dividing, it is more likely to obtain mutations and then accumulate mutations. And as discussed in AMP1, when those mutations affect the cell cycle, this can lead to cancer. So number two. What is the mucociliary elevator? The cells of the pseudostratified columnar epithelium in the respiratory mucosa have cilia, as we just saw, and the cilia will sweep the mucus and then any debris or pathogens that are trapped in the mucus to the pharynx so that it can be swallowed into the digestive tract. So here is a drawing representing the mucociliary elevator. So if you imagine this being the uh, trachea or a bronchiole, air is going to be moving downward to the lungs, but these uh, goblet cells and the mucus glands are secreting mucus, shown by the yellow squiggly line, and the cilia are moving that mucus up to the pharynx along with any debris that gets stuck in it. And so here is another image uh, from a textbook, again showing you the same thing, how you can get foreign particles stuck in the mucus, and the cilia is sweeping the mucus up, that's why it's called an elevator, to the pharynx. So therefore, the mucociliary elevator plays a key role in the respiratory defense system, 
and it's designed to capture the pathogens in the mucus and then sweep them upward and swallow them so they get subjected to the stomach's acid, which will kill them. Number three, what is bronchitis? Why would a cigarette smoker have chronic bronchitis? So bronchitis is the inflammation and constriction of the bronchioles that is caused by a respiratory infection. Exposure to cigarette smoke triggers an inflammatory response in the lungs. So this is going to result in an increased production of mucus. But because of the cigarette smoke and the inflammatory responses that happen over time, the cilia on those epithelial cells becomes damaged. And as the cilia becomes damaged, the mucociliary ciliary elevator doesn't function as well as it should. And so here's an image that shows a normal airway with healthy functioning cilia and a production of a moderate amount of mucus. And then with a chronic bronchitis condition, you have reduced diameter of the uh, airways due to the inflammation. You also have increase in mucus production and you have damaged cilia on the cells. So the mucus will start to pool or collect in the bronchioles, and this provides a nutrient-rich source for bacteria. So instead of being swept up to the pharynx to be swallowed, the bacteria stays trapped in the mucus, and it can begin to colonize the mucus and use it as a food source and start to multiply, which leads to an infection. So you normally have the mucociliary ciliary elevator that keeps the mucus moving upward, but when you have faulty cilia, the mucus will just sit there and collect and you're making extra mucus because of the inflammation and the bacteria can use this as a food source. So this is why cigarette smokers have chronic bronchitis, so they have repeated infections with a need to take antibiotics. Number four, describe the bronchial tree. Trace the path of airflow from the nose to the alveoli. Where is Daniel's tumor? And how could this interfere with airflow? So the first part, we're going to describe the bronchial tree. So the bronchial tree is used to describe the progressively smaller branching of the airways within the lungs. And you can think of it like an upside down tree. So as you move away from the trunk, the branches get smaller and smaller. So the larger trunk and branches are lined mainly with cartilage. And then as the branches progress to smaller and smaller branches, the amount of cartilage decreases and the amount of smooth muscle increases. So in order of decreasing size, so we're going from the largest to the smallest, we have the trachea, which is the largest passageway. So this is the trunk of the upside down tree. Then you have a main bronchus, one for each lung. Then you have a lobar bronchus and one for each lobe of the lung. So you would have three on the right side and two on the left side. You then have a segmental bronchus and you have one of these for each bronchopulmonary segment. And there are eight to 10 bronchopulmonary segments per lung. You then go into smaller bronchioles and then finally you get to a terminal bronchiole and you have one of these for each pulmonary lobule. And then within the pulmonary lobule, you have respiratory bronchioles. And then the respiratory bronchioles open up into alveolar ducts, which feed into alveolar sacs. And then you get into your alveoli. So now let's look at the second part of the question, trace the path of airflow from the nose to the alveoli. So we're going to start with the nose. From there, air enters the nasal cavity. Then it passes back into the nasopharynx, which is the superior part of the pharynx. It then passes through the oropharynx and then through the laryngopharynx and then into the larynx. And it enters the larynx through the opening called the glottis. And then after passing into the larynx, air will then pass into the trachea and then into the main bronchus, then into a lobar bronchus, then into a segmental bronchus, then it's gonna go out into smaller bronchioles, eventually making its way into a terminal bronchiole, and then into a respiratory bronchiole, 
and then into an alveolar duct and sac, and then finally to the alveoli where gas exchange will take place. So the second part of the question, where is Daniel's tumor and how could this interfere with airflow? Daniel's tumor was located in the superior portion of his right main bronchus. So his tumor was in the main bronchus, and remember we have one per lung. So since the tumor was nearly occluding or blocking his right main bronchus, Daniel was getting very little air into his entire right lung. So remember that a main bronchus brings air to the entire lung, and you have two main bronchi, one per lung. Number five, why does Daniel have shortness of breath? Discuss three possible reasons. So shortness of breath, which is also known as dyspnea, is a sensation of being unable to breathe normally or feeling suffocated. So many things can cause shortness of breath, but in Daniel's case, it is likely a combination of three factors. Number one, his tumor is blocking the right main bronchus, which is reducing airflow to the right lung. So this is going to reduce his breathing ability by half, and he's relying mainly on his left lung. But he also has chronic bronchitis, so this is a chronic condition of a reduced airway diameter and an increased mucus production in the respiratory passageways. So both the reduced diameter and the increase in mucus is going to reduce the total amount of air that is able to get into the lungs with each breath. So he's already limited to one lung, now the air is further limited by the inflammation, the decreased diameter, and the increase in mucus. And then he's an older person with a 40 pack per year smoking history, so he also likely has emphysema. This involves destruction of the lung tissue, particularly the alveolar surfaces and the elastic tissue surrounding the alveoli. And so the destruction of the alveolar surfaces would reduce the available surface area for gas exchange, making the gas exchange process less efficient. And the loss of elastic fibers will also make it harder to exhale or move air out of the lungs, which would further hinder airflow. Okay, in part two, we're gonna look at restrictive and obstructive lung diseases. And we're gonna start with case number one, Jenny Smith. So Jenny Smith was a 14-year-old girl with asthma, and she had been under relatively good control until last night. She slept over at a friend's house and woke up in the middle of the night with severe shortness of breath and an unproductive cough. She had expiratory wheezing. Unfortunately, she did not take her bronchodilator medication with her to her friend's house, so she was taken to the emergency walk-in clinic. On physical exam, she was wheezing loudly and using her accessory muscles of respiration to help her breathe. Pulmonary function testing revealed the graph shown below. So here's the graph, and number one says, based on the graph, fill in the following data. So before we look at these uh, different points on the graph, let's look at the graph and see what we can tell. So you look for the smallest peaks and valleys, and those represent the tidal volume. So it can help if you draw a line above and below the tidal volumes, because a lot of these other volumes are in relation to the tidal volume. So again, these smaller peaks and valleys are the tidal volume, and so the tidal volume amount would be this amount right here, which is 350 milliliters. So the inspiratory reserve volume, or IRV, is going to be from the top of the tidal volume to the highest peak on the graph. So if we look for an arrow that represents that, we see the green one here runs from the top of the tidal volume to the highest peak on the graph. And so the IRV, in her case, would be 1,600 milliliters. The expiratory reserve volume is going to go from the bottom of the tidal volume to the lowest point on the graph, or the lowest valley in the graph. And so that would be this blue arrow here, going from the bottom of the tidal volume to the lowest valley on the graph. So the ERV would be 300 milliliters. And then the vital capacity, remember capacities are sums of volumes. 
So the vital capacity is going to be the sum of the tidal volume, the IRV, and the ERV. So if we look for an arrow on the graph that encompasses all three of these measurements, we find this arrow here that includes the IRV, the tidal volume, and the ERV. So her vital capacity is going to be 2,250 milliliters. And again, vital capacity is a sum of the tidal volume, the inspiratory reserve volume, and the expiratory reserve volume. So also shown on this graph, if you're wondering what the other numbers are, the residual volume is shown down here. It is from the bottom of the tidal volume to the bottom of the graph. And her, in her case, it's 1,800 milliliters. This kind of represents the dead air that never leaves the lungs. So it is the air that stays behind even after you have exhaled as much as you can. And also shown on the graph is the total lung capacity, which is 4,050 milliliters. And the total lung capacity is going to be the sum of the vital capacity plus the residual volume. So 1,800 plus 2,250 would equal 4050. Number two, describe what asthma is and how it affects Jenny's airflow. At the hospital, they gave her a bronchodilator. Describe the effects this medication would have on her volumes and capacities that were discussed in number one. So asthma is a chronic inflammation of the bronchioles. During an active asthma attack, the bronchioles narrow even more, making it difficult to move air into and out of the lungs. So on the left here, we're showing a normal airway. In the middle, we have an asthmatic airway. And so notice that even when they're not having an attack, they already start with a narrow diameter of the bronchioles. And then during an active asthma attack, the airway passage narrows even more, and you also would have an increased production of mucus, which is going to make the space for air to pass through very, very small, and that is why she was wheezing. So asthmatics who are having an attack find it especially hard to exhale, which is going to increase the residual volume in the lungs, which is the amount of air left behind. So Jenny's tidal volume, her inspiratory reserve volume, her expiratory reserve volume, and her vital capacity would all be below normal, with her expiratory reserve volume being affected the most. So what effect would the medication have? So a bronchodilator would increase the diameter of the bronchioles to allow more air to pass through them. So dilation of the bronchioles should in increase the tidal volume, the IRV, the ERV, and the vital capacity. And for example, her vital capacity that we saw on the graph during the attack was 2,250 milliliters, but it went up to 2,800 milliliters after using the medication. And again, remember, vital capacity is a sum of the tidal volume, IRV, and ERV. And since the vital capacity increases, more air is moving into and out of the lungs, so the residual volume would decrease. Number three, look at the illustration below showing the differences between an obstructive lung disease and a restrictive lung disease. What is meant by compliance and which condition is Jenny suffering from? So restrictive lung diseases are as a result of a decrease in compliance. And compliance is a measure of the expandability of the lungs. So a decrease in compliance would mean that it takes greater force or effort to expand the lungs. Obstructive lung diseases involve an increased resistance to airflow, meaning it is harder to move air into and out of the lungs through the passageways. Since asthma causes constriction of the bronchioles from a chronic inflammation, asthma is a type of obstructive lung disease. So the narrowing of the bronchioles increases the resistance to airflow, and that was preventing Jenny from moving as much air into and out of her lungs. Number four, what muscles are involved with normal resting inhalation and exhalation? Jenny was using accessory muscles to help her breathe. What does this mean? 
So during inhalation at rest, which is also called quiet breathing, only the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles contract. Contraction of the diaphragm flattens it, lowering the floor of the thoracic cavity. Contraction of the external intercostal muscles raise the ribs, and both actions increase the volume of the thoracic cavity. During exhalation at rest, which is called quiet breathing, both of these muscles, the diaphragm and the external intercostals, relax and return to their original positions. The return of the muscles to their original positions will decrease the volume of the thoracic cavity, so the diaphragm raises back up, which raises the floor of the thoracic ca uh, cage, and the ribs will lower again. And so this is a passive process because to do the exhalation, we are only relaxing muscles. We are not actually having to contract muscles during the exhalation process. So the accessory muscle question, so she was using accessory muscles and what does this mean? Accessory muscles help to increase the speed and amount of rib movement during inhalation, and this is called forced breathing. And accessory muscles can also help to depress the ribs and compress the abdomen during exhalation, and again, this would be during forced breathing. So Jenny's use of accessory muscles means that she was having a harder time breathing normally, so she was needing to increase the depth of her breathing, and that is why she engaged her accessory muscles. So we're still in part two, restrictive and obstructive lung diseases, but now we're gonna look at case number two, James Fischel. So James Fischel is a 56-year-old maintenance worker who has worked for the same company for 32 years, spending most of his time installing and removing insulation from buildings. He saw his physician with complaints of becoming increasingly short of breath over the past year, particularly when he is exerting himself. He notes that just getting enough air in is exhausting. A chest x-ray revealed a hazy appearance of the lungs. Pulmonary function testing was done and the results are shown below. So again, we're given a spirometry graph and asked to identify certain values. And again, it might help you at least when you're starting out to recognize where the tidal volume is, which is gonna be the smaller peaks and valleys. And you could even draw lines to help yourself better visualize the different volumes. So the tidal volume in this case will be the 500 milliliters and that's normal. So the average tidal volume of both males and females is 500 milliliters. So his tidal volume is fine. Remember that the inspiratory reserve volume is gonna go from the top of the tidal volume to the highest peak on the graph. And in this case, that would be 1200 milliliters. The expiratory reserve volume is gonna go from the bottle, bottom of the tidal volume to the uh, lowest most valley on the graph. So in this case, that arrow's a little off, but that would be the 1000 milliliter value there. And then the vital capacity, if you remember, is a sum of the tidal volume, the IRV, and the ERV. So it's going to run from the bottom most valley to the top most peak. So it would be this value right here, so 2,700 milliliters. And then the other values shown on this particular spirometry graph are the residual volume, which runs from the bottom most valley to the bottom of the graph, which in this case is 800 milliliters and then the total lung capacity, which is the sum of the vital capacity and the residual volume. So that in this case, that would be the line going from the topmost peak to the very bottom of the graph, and that would be 3,500 milliliters. So number six, James's lung compliance has decreased over the years. What does this mean? How does this manifest itself in James's lung values? And what type of lung condition does James have? So a decrease in lung compliance means that James's lungs do not expand very easily. So it requires more effort or force for him to inhale. James actually has a severely reduced inspiratory reserve volume. So James's IRV is only 1200 milliliters and the normal IRV for a male is around 3300 milliliters or 3.3 liters. Also, James has a very reduced total lung capacity. His lung capacity is only 3.5 liters or 3,500 milliliters, 
while a healthy male's lung capacity should be close to 6,000 milliliters. So the large reduction in the IRV means that James is having a harder time getting air into his lungs, but his normal tidal volume and his normal ERV suggests that the problem isn't with the air flow. So he can move enough air out of his lungs and he can move enough air uh, when he's breathing quietly at rest. So it doesn't seem to be an airflow problem like we saw with the girl having the asthma attack in the previous case. So since airflow doesn't seem to be an issue because he does have the normal tidal volume in ERV, and the issue seems to be with the inhalation, which is involving expansion of the lungs, James has a restrictive lung disease as a result of decreased compliance, meaning it is harder for his lungs to expand. So number seven, James likely suffers from pulmonary asbestosis, a condition caused by the excessive inhalation of asbestos fibers used in older forms of insulation. Once the inhaled asbestos filaments reach the alveoli, they are attacked by macrophages. The resulting inflammatory response results in the formation of scar tissue in the alveoli called pulmonary fibrosis. The scar tissue makes it harder to bring air into the lungs. Can you think of other conditions that would cause decreased compliance? So if we take a look at uh, asbestos and lung disease, so when you inhale the fibers, the asbestos fibers into your lung, and the same is true with things like coal dust, once it gets into the lungs, it's going to trigger an inflammatory, uh, inflammatory reaction, macrophages are going to come in, and eventually you're going to have actual damage to the lungs that gets replaced by scar tissue, and scar tissue is very non-elastic, so it's very rigid. So having a bunch of scar tissue in your lungs means your lungs have a difficult time expanding um, when you inhale. And we also know that asbestos can cause changes that can eventually lead to cancer, like a type of cancer called mesothelioma. And so this is why um, asbestos is now outlawed and not allowed to be used in insulation, but it might still be out there in older forms of insulation. So to go back to the question, can you think of other conditions that would cause decreased compliance? So remember, when we talk about decreased compliance, we're talking about things that make it harder for the lungs to expand. So some examples include a pneumothorax, when air gets into the pleural cavity and breaks the fluid bond between the pleural membranes. Without that fluid bond, the visceral pleura that is lining the lungs doesn't move with the parietal pleura that is lining the thoracic cavity, and so the lung doesn't expand when the volume of the thoracic cavity expands. Any condition that would weaken the inhalation muscles, like the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles, would also cause problems with lung expansion. So if these muscles have problems contracting, then the volume of the thoracic cavity doesn't increase as much, and so the lungs cannot expand fully. So this could happen in conditions like muscular dystrophy, which we talked about uh, in a and 1, or a condition like ALS or a myotrophic lateral sclerosis, in which you have uh, deterioration of the motor neurons that send signals out to skeletal muscles, which would include the diaphragm and the external intercostals. Any condition that would lead to scar tissue in the lungs would also decrease compliance. So the scar tissue, as I mentioned earlier, makes the lungs less flexible and harder to expand. Examples include things like systemic, systemic sclerosis or a condition called scleroderma, also coal miner's lung from people who inhale a lot of coal dust, and then things like the asbestos that we just looked at. Loss of surfactant would result in the collapse of the alveoli with each exhale and this would require more force to inhale or expand the lungs. And this, when you have a loss of surfactant, this is a condition called respiratory distress syndrome. So this would also be a restrictive lung disorder that decreases compliance. And anything that causes reduced mobility of the thoracic cage, so the ability of the ribs to raise up, 
and this can happen with aging. So for example, you can get arthritis in the joints between the ribs and the thoracic vertebrae, and that can make the ribs less mobile, which means you're going to have a harder time changing the volume of the thoracic cavity. So decreased compliance will happen with anything that makes it harder to increase the volume of the thoracic cavity or anything that allows the lungs to expand once the volume of the thoracic cavity increases. So now we'll look at case number three, Joe Smith, and we're still looking at restrictive and obstructive lung diseases. So Joe Smith is a 69-year-old male with a 50-year history of smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Over the past five years, he has become increasingly short of breath. At first, he noticed this only when exercising, but now he is even short of breath at rest. His breathing is now assisted by the use of his accessory muscles. Joe has been diagnosed with emphysema. Pulmonary function revealed the graph below. All right, so we're looking at another spirometry graph. And so by now, uh, you know that the key is to find the smaller peaks and valleys and look at those as reference points. So if we look at the values on this graph, starting with the tidal volume, Joe's tidal volume is 500 milliliters, so that is normal. His IRV is going to be from the top of the tidal volume to the highest peak. So in this graph, that would be 1,800 milliliters. The ERV is from the bottom of the tidal volume to the lowest um, valley, and so on this graph that would be the 400 milliliters. Vital capacity is a sum of the tidal volume, IRV, and ERV, so in this graph that is represented by the 2700 milliliters. Also shown is the residual volume, which in this case is 2000 milliliters, and then the total lung capacity which is the vital capacity plus the residual volume is 4,700 milliliters. Number nine, describe the changes in the lungs that occur with emphysema. So in emphysema, there is a loss and damage to the alveolar surfaces. So multiple alveoli coalesce into larger air pockets, which greatly reduces the available surface area of the blood-air barrier, which is available for gas exchange. So if we take a, picture, a look at this picture here that is showing the changes that happen in the lungs with emphysema, so you can see that you're going to have increased mucus in your bronchioles, but you're also going to have very enlarged alveoli because the little walls that were previously between the separate air pockets start degrading and um, become damaged. And so instead of having a bunch of smaller air pockets, you end up having just one or two big large air pockets. So you have a reduction in the surface area. You also end up having fewer capillaries and you also end up getting the loss of the elastic fibers. Down here we have some histology slides. So on the left we have two different images of healthy lung tissue from a normal person, um, so someone who doesn't have emphysema. So you can see all of the millions of little air pockets, so very extensive surface area. And on the right side, you can see lungs from a patient with emphysema. So you can especially notice this in the bottom picture, just how much of the surface area is being lost as a lot of these little tiny pockets are coalescing into just a few larger pockets. So as I mentioned, there is also damage to the elastic fibers around the alveoli, which can result in problems with the elastic recoil during exhalation which traps more air in the lungs and makes it harder to exhale as much air. So this is why we saw that um, Joe had a very large residual volume. The tissue destruction can also lead to the collapse of smaller bronchioles, which traps air inside the lungs, and this would also increase that residual volume. Here's a picture that again is just showing you some of the changes that take place with emphysema. And if smoking is the cause of the emphysema, not only are you losing the surface area and ending up with single large cavities instead of multiple smaller cavities, but you're also getting carbon deposits from the cigarette smoke that build up inside on the membranes as well, which is going to further decrease the efficiency of the gas exchange.
So here is an actual uh, dissection of a lung of a patient, a smoker who had emphysema. And so you can see that even after death, when they look at the tissue, you can see all of the tar and carbon buildup that accumulates in the lungs over time from the compounds in the cigarette smoke. Number 10, describe the blood air barrier and review the five reasons why gas, gas exchange occurs efficiently at the blood air barrier. How does emphysema affect Joe's ability to transfer oxygen and carbon at the blood air barrier? So the blood air barrier consists of three layers. The first one are the epithelial cells lining the alveolus, and these are the pneumocytes type 1. Remember, just as a side note, pneumocytes type 2 are more rare, and they produce the surfactant. Then you have the fused basement membrane, and then you have the endothelial cells lining the capillary. So if we look at this image, up here would be the air inside the alveolus. Then you have the alveolar epithelium, so these would be the pneumocytes type 1. You have the fused basement membrane, and then you have the endothelial cells that are lining the blood vessel down here. So five reasons why gas exchange occurs efficiently is because there are substantial differences in the partial pressures of gases across the membrane. There are very short distances involved, so only 0.5 micrometers. Gases are lipid soluble, so they easily cross directly over the plasma membrane of the cells. The total surface area of all of the alveoli combined is very large. And blood and airflow are coordinated so that blood goes to the alveoli with the most oxygen and fresh inhaled air goes to the alveoli with the least oxygen. So emphysema causes destruction and damage to the alveolar surfaces. So emphysema is destroying the alveolar surfaces and reducing the total available surface area for gas exchange, which makes the whole process less efficient. And here is some more histology slides. So again, on the left side is a normal lung without emphysema. And you can see the extensive surface area. This is two different levels of magnification. And then in the emphysema patient on the right side, you can see that we have lost a lot of surface area. So we have more open spaces and less of the membrane for um, the carbon dioxide and oxygen to cross from the air to the blood and vice versa. Number 11, what would you predict about the partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide in Joe's arterial or oxygenated blood? And what are normal levels for oxygenated arterial blood? So I added in the words oxygenated um, just to make this very clear, but I do want to point out that when the textbook or any of your mastering A&P questions just say arterial blood and they don't specify, they are referring to arteries in the systemic circuit which carry oxygenated blood. And when it just says venous blood, it is referring to the veins in the systemic circuit which carry deoxygenated blood. So as a reminder, when you're in the systemic circuit, arteries leaving the heart are oxygenated and then the veins coming back to the heart are deoxygenated. And it's opposite in the pulmonary circuit. In the pulmonary circuit, arteries are deoxygenated and veins are oxygenated. But when you see just the term arterial and venous being used without any clarification on the oxygenation status, they are referring to the systemic circuit. So in this question, uh, it is essentially asking you what is the levels of the gases in the arterial blood in the systemic circuit. So normal levels for oxygenated blood in systemic arteries is uh, 95 to 100 millimeters of mercury for the oxygen. So when it leaves the lungs, it starts out at 100 millimeters mercury, but by the time it gets into the systemic circuit, it has usually fallen to around 95 millimeters mercury. And the pressure of the CO2 in these arteries is going to be 40 millimeters mercury. So due to the decreased efficiency of gas exchange in Joe's lungs due to his emphysema, we would predict that Joe's arterial oxygen levels would be lower, so he's got decreased ability to uh, take oxygen into the blood and to 
uh, move CO2 from the blood to the lungs. So less oxygen is going from the air to the blood, so we would expect lower oxygen levels. And we would also predict that his arterial carbon dioxide levels would increase because less carbon dioxide is going from his blood back out to the air. And in fact, if we do take a blood gas result, and blood gas results are usually taken from systemic arteries, so Joe's actual arterial blood gas results are that his PO2 is 73 millimeters mercury, so you can see that is decreased, and his PCO2 is 50 millimeters mercury, so you can see that is definitely increased. Number 12, a blood test shows that Joe's hematocrit was elevated. His was 59%, a normal hematocrit is between 42 and 54%. Why would his hematocrit be high? So as a reminder, the hematocrit is the percentage of formed elements in the whole blood. As we just saw in the previous question, Joe's emphysema has resulted in lower partial pressures of oxygen levels in his oxygenated blood. If you remember from chapter 19, when the kidneys sense a reduced oxygen level, they secrete erythropoietin, or EPO. EPO is a signal for the red bone marrow to produce additional red blood cells. As additional red blood cells are added to the blood, the hematocrit will increase because there will be more red blood cells, which increases the overall percentage of formed elements, which raises the hematocrit. So, bottom line, Joe's emphysema is resulting in lower oxygen delivery to the tissues, a condition called hypoxia, by the way, what, which causes an increase in the EPO secretion, which results in an increase in red blood cell production, which is going to elevate the hematocrit. Number 13, is emphysema a restrictive or obstructive lung disease? Explain. So recall that restrictive lung diseases are a result of decreased compliance, meaning the lung is harder to expand. Obstructive lung diseases are a result of increased resistance to airflow, so you're having problem moving the air through the passages. So due to the loss of the elastic fibers around the alveoli and emphysema, it actually becomes easier for our patients with emphysema to inhale. So for them, it is easier to expand the lungs because they are not pushing against these rubber bands that are wrapping around the alveoli. So emphysema actually increases compliance and makes it easier for the lungs to expand, which is the opposite of what a restrictive lung disease does. So emphysema is not a restrictive lung disease. However, the loss of the elastic fibers makes it harder to exhale air, so you don't get the elastic rebound that helps to push air out of the lungs. And this is also why Joe has such a very small expiratory reserve volume, or ERV. And then the tissue damage can also collapse bronchioles and trapping, uh, traps air in the respiratory tract. So thus, emphysema increases the resistance to airflow and is a type of obstructive lung disease. In fact, emphysema is part of a group of diseases called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. So COPD is when you do have a type of an obstructive lung disease that is in a chronic, so it's ongoing. Uh, the most frequent causes are smoking, air pollutants, and genes. And two of the biggest um, types of COPD are going to be the emphysema that we just talked about and chronic bronchitis, um, as we talked about in the very first case study with Daniel, the smoker who had lung cancer. And then in our last part, part three, we'll look at some miscellaneous questions. So number one, a patient complains of sudden sharp stabbing pain in the right side of the chest with each inhalation and exhalation. The pain intensifies with coughing, sneezing, deep breathing, or laughing. Listening with a stethoscope, the doctor hears a rough, scratchy sound when the patient breathes. What is this patient's likely problem? And then describe the membranes that surround the lungs. So this patient is likely suffering from pleurisy, 
And pleurisy has many causes. It could be a virus or a bacteria that spreads from the lungs to the membranes. It could be an autoimmune disorder where the body's immune system attacks the membranes. And it could even be due to a chest injury. In pleurisy, the lining of the lungs, called the pleural membranes, are inflamed and the inflamed membranes rub up against each other during every breath, causing severe pain to the patient. So here's an image of what that might look like, and in this case, uh, the pleurisy was caused by the movement of an infection in the lungs to the membrane. And so both of the membranes become inflamed, and so you also have reduced production of the fluid between the two membranes, so you get a lot of friction between the two membranes and it becomes very painful every time you breathe. So now let's look at the two pleural membranes and we'll use this picture to help us. So the parietal pleura is the membrane that lines the wall of the thoracic cavity, so that is shown over here. The visceral pleura is the membrane that lines the outside surface of the lungs, shown here. So the space between the two membranes is called the pleural cavity and this space contains pleural fluid. So the pleural fluid forms a negative pressure fluid bond between the two membranes so that changes in the thoracic cavity volume will also cause changes in the lung volume. In some cases of pleurisy, additional fluid can build up inside the pleural cavity and this is called pleural effusion. This can reduce the pain because the extra fluid decreases the friction between the two membranes, but it can cause shortness of breath because having too much fluid in this space reduces the available room for the lungs to expand during breathing. Number two, describe the pressure changes that occur in the thoracic cavity during respiration and how this affects the movement of air. What role does negative pressure play in this process? So I'm going to actually answer the second question first. So the negative pressure or suction between the two pleural membranes due to the fluid bond ensures that the volume of the lungs changes when the volume of the thoracic cavity changes. So for example, when the thoracic cavity, which is lined by the parietal pleura, is pulled upwards and outwards during inhalation, the fluid bond will ensure that the membrane on the lungs, called the visceral pleura, also goes with it, which will change the volume of the lungs as well. And also note that this negative pressure between the pleural membranes is called the intrapleural pressure. So now let's look at pressure and volume changes and how this affects air movement. So when the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles contract, the diaphragm moves downward, the rib cage moves upward and outward, the size of the thoracic cavity increases. So as long as we have that fluid bond and the negative intrapleural pressure, then the lung will move with the thoracic cavity and will also increase in volume. So as the volume increases, the pressure inside the thoracic cavity and lungs will decrease and that is Boyle's Law, so pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So now the pressure outside, so the atmospheric pressure, is greater than the pressure inside the lungs, which is the intrapulmonary pressure or intraalveolar pressure. So remember, pressure decreased on the inside, so we have lower pressure on the inside. And air always moves from high to low pressure so air will move into the lungs. When the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles relax, the size of the thoracic cavity will decrease. As the volume decreases, the pressure inside the thoracic cavity and lungs will increase. Again, that's Boyle's Law. So now the pressure outside the atmospheric pressure is less than the pressure inside the intrapulmonary pressure because again we increase the pressure inside by decreasing the volume. Again air wants to move from high pressure to low pressure so air will move out of the lungs and into the atmosphere. So this is exhalation and this one up here would be inhalation.
Number three, how is oxygen transported through the blood? How is carbon dioxide transported through the blood? So let's look at oxygen first. Oxygen is transported through the blood mainly by being bound to hemoglobin. A very small amount will stay dissolved in the plasma. So here's a picture here. So we're going to talk first about what's happening in the uh, alveolar airspace. So when the red blood cell is in an alveolar capillary, also called a pulmonary capillary. So as oxygen moves into the plasma in the alveoli, the oxygen is then taken up by the red blood cells, and this allows the blood to carry more oxygen than it could if it didn't have the red blood cells. And the reason why the oxygen is moving into the red blood cells is because the uh, red blood cells and the plasma that is coming into the uh, alveolar capillary is coming in deoxygenated. So gases want to move from areas of high pressure to low pressure. So because the blood at this point is deoxygenated, the oxygen pressure is higher in the air and lower in the blood. So this is why oxygen is moving into the blood. So once the oxygen gets into the red blood cell, it's going to bind to the iron that is inside that heme group of hemoglobin. And as a reminder, four oxygen molecules can bind to one hemoglobin molecule because there are four heme groups. And hemoglobin saturation refers to how many oxygen molecules are bound to each hemoglobin molecule. So 100% saturation would mean all four spots are occupied by oxygen. So we have the hemoglobin bound to the majority of the oxygen. Then the blood is going to move out to the tissues. Now the partial pressures are higher inside the blood than in the tissues. And again, gases want to move from high to low pressure. So in this case, now the oxygen is going to want to leave the blood and go into the tissues. And so when the blood gets to the tissues, the hemoglobin will release the oxygen and it will remove, move through the plasma and then out into the tissues where there is the lower partial pressure of oxygen. So now let's take a look at carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is transported through the blood in three ways. And this time we're going to start on the tissue side. So the tissues are where the carbon dioxide is being produced. It's being produced by all of the cells in the body as a waste product. So we're going to have high carbon dioxide levels in the tissues. So the majority of the carbon dioxide is going to go into the red blood cell where it will be converted to carbonic acid when it is picked up in the tissues. So here's the equation. Carbon dioxide combines with water and through the action of an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase that is found inside the red blood cells, the carbon dioxide in water is converted to carbonic acid and then the carbonic acid immediately dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. So the hydrogen ions will stay in the red blood cell and bind to hemoglobin. The bicarbonate ions will exit the red blood cell and move into the plasma in exchange for a chloride ion, and this is called the chloride shift. And then the blood is going to move from the tissues to the capillaries in the lungs. So now if we look inside the alveolar capillary, now the process is going to be reversed because now the levels of carbon dioxide are higher in the blood than they are in the air. So now the carbon dioxide is going to want to move from the blood out to the air. So this entire process that we just looked at is reversed. So the bicarbonate and chloride ions switch places again. This time the bicarbonate is coming back into the red blood cells and the chloride is going back into the plasma. So the equation that we just looked at before is going to be reversed. So the hydrogen ions that had stayed inside bound to the hemoglobin are going to combine with the uh, bicarbonate ions to make carbonic acid. And then the carbonic acid is going to be broken down into carbon dioxide and uh, water. And so the carbon dioxide will then leave the red blood cell and go out into the airspace and be exhaled. So that is the first way and that is the way that the majority of the carbon dioxide is transported. Some carbon dioxide, 23%, binds directly to hemoglobin to form 
carb amino hemoglobin, and then when it gets to the lungs, it will be released. And then a small portion of the carbon dioxide will stay dissolved in the plasma, again, until it gets to the lungs where it will come out of the plasma and be released. So bottom line, the majority of the carbon dioxide is transported in the plasma as bicarbonate ions. And then number four, our last question, sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS, also known as cot death or crib death, involves the sudden death of an infant without any obvious cause. It typically occurs while an infant is sleeping. While the cause of SIDS has not yet been completely determined, one hypothesis has been that in some cases there is a problem in the brain stem with the development of the breathing control centers. So review the respiratory control centers in the medulla oblongata and the pons. So the respiratory rhythmicity centers are located in the medulla oblongata. This is the most basic level of respiratory control and contains the pacemaker cells that set the basic pace of respiration. There is a dorsal respiratory group or DRG that functions in every respiratory cycle and contains the inspiratory centers that control the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. There is also a ventral respiratory group or a VRG that functions only during forced breathing and it has inspiratory and expiratory centers that control the accessory respiratory muscles. Then we have the apneustic and the pneumotaxic centers in the pons. And so these centers can adjust the activity of the respiratory rhythmicity centers to regulate the depth and the rate of respiration in response to sensory input or higher level control. The apneustic center adjusts inhalation by stimulating the DRG in the medulla oblongata and the pneumotaxic center adjusts exhalation by inhibiting the apneustic center. And that is the end of the chapter 23 activity.